days. Moose Moose days, Jake DeWitt and Sheila DeVos. Well, apparently there's something as Sheila DeVos here. Sorry. There's something went sideways at the area. I'm not quite sure what that means. Cow fell over. I don't know. But he's not going to be here. So um, I will do this presentation on behalf of the folks that have uh, expressed an interest in bringing back Moose Moose days. So uh, this is not my event, just to be very clear. I was approached by uh, Jake last year, who suggested that he would be putting on his fault plan and that he had a lot of fun. Feedback from folks who were interested in, in having those fun stays. If I look here, that shows people in this room that can attest to it. This used to be a very fun event, apparently. Um, certainly, there cannot be to be maximum. There were in the past because in the past there were a lot of drinking, mud bogging, and I don't even know what that is, <laughs> but that's not going to happen. So, the premise of this event was that Jake would be able to uh, put on his uh, alternate and that some of the other folks in town that may want to have some activities events could be part of that whole weekend and make it something a little bigger. We've had about four or five meetings. We've had anywhere from six to 18 people join us, and uh, we do have some genuine interest in doing this on that weekend. So, uh, I thought it would be a good idea if we just let everybody know where we were at. Uh, there's still opportunities for others to become engaged. Um, I was able to pull together some history, these are just pictures that uh, we were able to find. I mean, this does go back considerably some time. And the Moose Mouse uh, did make the resurgence last year, the actual costume, the heads in the ring <laughs> outfit. But uh, there was coins, there was badges, there were pins, there was all the last thing that they said. I'm sure there's people in this room that can speak this much better than I, but I'm here to tell you what's in the copy. So that's a little bit of the history. So the next slide will be. These are all the folks that have come to the table and said that they are definitely going to be part of this. So you've got the fastball taking place, the pack, uh, Shoe Schwab Cause will be involved, St. Louis Car Club. That's a brand new car club, by the way, not the guys that do the and John. Uh, the curling club is going to be involved, the Eagles and football, and the, the Chamber of Commerce is agreed to help out with the beer fund. So Jake will run his, his uh, fastball tournament. For the course of those two days, uh, it will be both men's and women's. He's already got registration, so that's moving along. And then after that, we've got the pack. So the whole concept here is if somebody wants to do something, it's their responsibility to fill in any of the permits, to provide the staff, et cetera, et cetera. And if they've got a charge or whatever it is, they have to keep that money. So there's no room here other than everybody being together that day. So the pack has decided they're going to do a hand drive and they talked to Murray, he's going to lend them their his radar gun and they're going to do a how fast he is going to pitch a ball. They'll you know pay two screen or something and there'll be some prizes for that. So they're going to do a little fundraiser at that and they'll be over at the uh, Nice and Park. Uh, she uh, will be running the concession that day, so I'm assuming they'll be hot dogs, pop chips, those kind of things. So, again, the other proceeds from that will go to them. Um, the Sickness Crumbling Club is actually going to host a dance, and obviously, they'll have a bar. They're still a little undecided as to where this is going to take place. Ideally, um, they were looking at the curling club because that's where they're out of, but it will be July. They'll be hot. They want to have a large crowd. They don't have sufficient washroom space, so they're looking at some options. So that's not written in stone yet. There is some talk of them working with the Legion. So some of this could spill out beyond Finley's Park. So as I said, the Sigma's Car Club, the young bunch of guys that have got together, they're pretty excited about putting this on. They've got um, some concept of having 200 cars. They've got a kids' component so that the kids can actually build the little car. There's kids, don't have all those details. They've talked with uh, Shane Carmel with regard to where they're going to be. So, there's a couple of sites he's talked about his property that backs onto the highway, and he's also talked about that 
lot should be cleared across the road, so possibly there. They are aware that they would have to get any permitting, fencing, etc. And that's one of the things that we've made clear is that everybody must be responsible for their own paperwork. Yes. Uh, Dead Heap is going to be running a pickleball tournament. Um, this won't be a sanctioned one because there's a lot of work to that, but she uh, believes she's going to have enough teams to actually do something for that weekend. So, again, she'll be in charge of our class. And uh, we'll run a beer garden over in Nice Park. So, it'll be the Eagles and the Cleaver Plumbers will help run that so that they can get the proceeds from that. And then there's obviously there's going to be some things that are going to be required. I guess in the past when the ball tournament took place last year, uh, there was a, a lack of um, garbage and uh, washrooms hadn't been assigned to be cleaned. So washrooms would need to be cleaned and garbage would be picked, need to be picked up. It is a full weekend anticipating a lot of people, some recycling receptacles and possibly some tents and tents. You've made everybody aware that you can actually apply through the district of Sickles to access those things, but it's going to be limited in their several rooms here. So it's going to be first come, first serve. You need to know what your needs are and how to go about getting. So those, this is kind of the process that we're going through. There'll be another meeting next month. Uh, anybody else who wishes to be involved will then have the opportunity to come forward. There had been a discussion about uh, right? Um, there was mixed feelings, I'll just say about that. And the parade in July is not a deal. Uh, the people that are actually going to be doing this, when, how are they going to be involved when the you know, it starts at 8 3 in the morning? The parade at 11 o'clock on Saturday, July is something to do, local roads, etc. So uh, I think that's using that burger to you know, take for what to even pursue that any further. So right now we're just trying to make this into a weekend. It is not a tourist attraction. This is for local people to enjoy that particular weekend and add new things to the ball tournament and have all of this for the nonprofits. So that's basically what's going on. I just wanted to make everybody aware of it and to let you know that there may be requests to council for support for this particular event. Questions. Thank you, Sheila. Council, any questions? Yes, Bob. Hi. Thank you to the chair. Um, the, that's the big softball tournament? Uh, fastball. Fastball. Sorry, fastball. A little slow. Yeah, fastball. Okay. And th that happens every year. So they're, they're thinking about doing it the same weekend just to augment the, the fastball tournament, make it a big fun weekend. As Jake has explained it, he's going to do his tournament regardless. He yeah. just wanted to know if people wanted to catch him. Mm -hmm. um, there will be other things, obviously, they're going to try and add to the food trucks, et cetera. And again, you need everybody aware if there's food trucks on the district property, they will need to fill out the proper permitting, et cetera. So just need, and I know there's probably a package that's being worked on now about what you need to do when you're looking to rent things. So we'll make sure that gets distributed to those individuals that want to put things on. But just to add to that weekend, yeah. So sorry, Sheila, this is the 28th, 29th of July. Yeah. Right before the August launch. Yeah. Hey, and so this, you're just giving us information. Yeah. There's no one that's really actually spearheading this. Um, it's kind of like, um, come if you want, uh, get a events book and bring it to the district and see what you can get. Well, so you're really, you're not asking for anything. If you're having meetings, if, yes, we're taking minutes and we're sharing them with the group that comes. And I'd like to follow you. That's just the way it's going on right now. Yeah. Okay. Hey, any other questions? Go ahead, Ian. Just a question. Who created the Moose Mouse? Anybody know? It was, I, I think it's been a um, um, mascot for Sycamus for many, many years. Like I'm going to, I'm going to say 40, 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. For the chair, it's Melwood. It's oh. <laughs> I bet you 77? Georgie Miller probably had something to do with it. And uh, I think 77. 
quite a weeks back hmm. to her parents. That's 45 yes. parents. It's, it's, a, it's quite a unique character. That's why I asked. It, yeah. I mean, if Moose Mouse gets resurrected to any degree, they need a new costume because that one's way too hot to. Uh, so the chamber is actually for the Moose Mouse. Really? It has ex it's expired. They only last forever. You have to reapply. Oh. So we've had to approach the patent office again. Um, to, to buy a costume it is a black however um, there's no way that he might have picked that yeah that's, that's probably a few thousand dollars oh. it would be doubtful they've taken the big hockey helmet out of the inside of it so it's not white but it would be they bought any other comments questions thank you sheila thank you sheila appreciate it Okay, so moving along, bylaws and policies, District of Sycamus Parks Regulation Bylaw, Amending Bylaw 1034-2023. Scott, did you want to take this away? And I, I don't have a slideshow, Kelly. Just... Oh, okay, so, okay, hold on. I just slideshow? <laughs> no slideshow for this one. Wow. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mayor Anderson. So um, at the, the last council meeting, um, council asked staff to look into um, bylaws to um, uh, address the issue of um, decriminalization of illicit drugs. Um, so in um, January 31st, um, it became um, decriminalized to use certain drugs in public, um, opioids, which includes heroin, MDMA, which is ecstasy, and um, methamphetamines. And so <clears throat> essentially that means that you can use them and you can possess them up to two and a half grams and uh, the police won't charge you or seize them. Trafficking is still illegal. Um, right now we're recommending, so I prepared a, a bylaw um, addressing the use of illicit drugs in, the, in parks. Um, and right now we're recommending that um, prior to any readings that uh, we initiate consultation. Um, and that consultation is with the medical health officer. So Sarah and I um, attended a uh, webinar. Um, a lot of really good information came out of that webinar. Um, kind of like a, there's two sides to every story. Um, I guess one of the one of the issues is if you do um, start to prohibit the use of it, it starts impacting people in a, a negative way. Um, people don't seek help. They don't seek medical services. They don't uh, notify emergency services. And um, and one of the one of the issues people who don't have people who would be using in the park would be the most at risk. Um, and if their drugs were seized, um, replace <clears throat> those drugs with some at even greater risk. Um, <clears throat> but um, throughout that webinar, um, one of the, one of the messages that, is, that was put forward was that the medical health officers are saying before you do anything, let's let's consult. Um, and I believe he's going to be available. The, the regional medical officers can be available on the 27th. Correct. Um, and available to meet with council on the 27th to, uh, to discuss the issue. Um, so we, we do have a bylaw. Um, basically, it works the same as, um, as alcohol in parks. We identified the, the same parks. Um, we identify, well, we, I guess, defined what those, those drugs are. And then, um, and then identified the use of those in those parks. Um, I did talk to the bylaw officer, and and you know he does his routine patrols in uh, in the district parks. Um, alcohol is a big issue, and usually he has no issues with telling people to to move on or to to not use the the alcohol. He says he has numerous times encountered people using illicit drugs as well, and usually it's the same. He tells them you know they should be doing that to move on. Um, probably much the same as smoking tobacco products. Um, so I guess the I guess the risks for the community would be, you know, increased um, use in parks could could expose people to smoke smoke of um, of the illicit drugs. Also, the like needles or other sharp things that people use, um, they be exposed to that. And then the idea that people go to the parks, they're expecting a fun family experience, and they're seeing people use illicit drugs, and they may might not want to use the parks. Um, but yeah, so I did prepare the, the bylaw. Um, 
I think we'll, I, I advise that we hold off until we, we speak to the, the medical officer, officer and get their opinion. Campbell River did um, adopt a bylaw and uh, it's being challenged right now in the courts. Um, so I guess we'll see what happens with their bylaw. I think theirs goes a little bit further and, and isn't just park. So this one was kind of the, the, the low hanging fruit where we already have a bylaw that prohibits alcohol and smoking. So if we add illicit drugs to that, it would cover off the parks that uh, major parks that people use. Um, but there always is an option to go a step further and, and say any public space I know some communities have, have said any public space for, for cannabis, so it is an option, but um, it's really up to the council to decide what, uh, what the next step is. Well, I'm sure everyone's got some, has an opinion. I find it interesting that they want to consult with us. Yes. We want to not have it in our parks, but I don't recall them consulting with us when they decided to roll this out. So. That's interesting. Um, any comments or <laughs> anyone? Go ahead, Bob. I read Dr. Mal Mal Malo Malo's uh, letter, and um, I do see it from their perspective. But I think that we have to consider everybody when we liberate these things. I think for now it would be a good idea to do consultation before we adopt the bylaw. But um, I'm of the opinion that you know um, at least this at least this new um, decriminalization will allow them the opportunity to, if they're going to use to be at a party with friends where there's other people that can attend to them if they have a problem. So at least it's better that way, but at least it's in a house <laughs> on, our, on our benches and faces. So, I mean, I think that we should do the consultation, but I, um, I kind of, uh, I see both ends of it. We got to protect everybody, not just the folks that are using, so. Ian? Yeah, um, I mean, I'd like to see this go further. I, I think it should be all public uh, spaces. And and I think there's a lot of rationale for that. Um, that's what applies to cannabis, is what applies to alcohol. Um, I don't see why this should be any different. Um, in terms of the consultation, I would say at the very least tonight, we should be passing first and second reading. Um, I'm willing to hear what he has to say, but um, this plan that the province has decided to foist upon everybody is not well thought out. It, it just isn't. I don't see how you can put all these other rules in place that the province and the federal government has done for a number of controlled substances. And then you get to your leaf of logic that it shouldn't apply to this. It's nonsensical. It doesn't make any sense. We're talking about the order of magnitude of 10 or 100 times more powerful drugs that have less regulations on, than cannabis or alcohol does. It's, it's an experiment that they want to try to see if it reduces um, um, deaths. And we should we should recognize that this is a bit of an experiment. They said, this is time for the next three years. Um, and then they'll kind of evaluate. This is the first jurisdiction to do it in Canada. But to do it without any real meaningful guardrails around this is, I think, irresponsible from the province. I, I, I don't think communities should be expected to join this great experiment and do it without any sensible rules around it. We're not talking about trying to not have it decriminalized. We obviously know that it is. The province decided that. What we're talking about is putting some sensible, common sense rules around this that you cannot actually do this in parks. You can't do this on a street corner. You can't do that in public because we have to balance the rights of other individuals in our community for their enjoyment of all these amenities that we offer as well. And what the province has set out here is denying them, I think, and will deny them proper and, and, and fair use of what they actually pay for as taxpayers. So at the very least, I'm for a, I, I would pass it tonight, to be totally honest, but I, I'm willing to go with the first and second reading and then uh, hear further feedback. But um, I take the mayor's point, you know, I, I didn't, 
there wasn't a lot of consultation on the other end. So I think what we have to do now is what's best for our community. And I, I can't see that put like putting guardrails on this and putting some rules or some minimal rules on this is the right thing for our community. So thank you. Yes, Mr. Chair, I, I agree 100%. I mean, you can't just have uh, this substance okay to use in public spaces and and not allow you, them to do cannabis or alcohol in public spaces. It's just it's just crazy. And it's how is our local uh, police authority going to going to you know handle this? And um, I just don't think it's good for good for our for for the system. It's, I think I agree with the uh, Ian. It should carry on. Malcolm. Yeah, I'm kind of in consensus too with uh, Ian and Gord. Um, but I think it should go further to public spaces in, in our bylaw. And uh, I, th I think the general population has a, has a right to enjoy uh, the public spaces that they pay tax dollars to use, not just a minority. Um, I understand the concept, it's to bottom line to save lives, but it's, it's a download from the provincial government. I think our local staff would need training and how to interact with uh, those kind of scenarios when they happen, as well as the police force. None of that. Uh, there's no awareness or knowledge or training. It's it's a little premature. And so I, I think the bylaw should include all public spaces. And uh, I don't think consultation with the interior health officer is going to change that, except maybe make more awareness on their part that it's a little premature. Okay, um, Yvonne then Pam. Thanks, Malcolm. Through the chair. Thank you. Um, I agree. I think um, we do need it to be all public spaces. Um, I think we have to protect our community and I think also our tourism. Um, it's not something, um, you know, it, I, I think we have to be really careful with this one. Um, and I would like to see at least a first reading. I do think we should listen to the public health officer and and you know if if we're enlightened on something we can always go back and and not go to our second but i think we need to get the ball rolling on this one and it's not something to um to kind of sit and, and wait it out i don't think it's it's a waited out thing thanks siobhan pam go ahead and sorry i might have seen eager but i just wanted to be ready <laughs> um i I think everybody's hit the nail on the head here with the concerns. Um, I do think that we do need to educate ourselves and consult wherever they're offering consultation. But I, I think that the potential for public trauma, for families, for children is, is, is prevalent um, when you don't control the safety of the substance that they're using, but you you also don't control where they're using it. And I I keep going back to thinking of of an overdose happening in a public place where there are children and families and the trauma of them having to 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 be around this. Um, Maybe that won't happen. Um, maybe we, you know, maybe we um, can prepare to make this decision and have the consultation. And, you know, I think we should make an effort to to consult and consider as much as possible. But I I agree with everyone. I I, I really think that this is it hasn't been given as much thought as everything else. And it and you you can't you can't decriminalize something and and tell us we can't put bylaws around it to sort of safeguard the public and families and children from witnessing stuff that is they shouldn't they shouldn't be modeled the use of this stuff in public and they should not have to witness you know, any incidents that come out of bad product and there's no regulation on the product. There's no safety and no safeguard around that. So I agree with everyone. This is a huge concern. And I, and I, I do, I do feel like it's kind of been dumped on the community to kind of, to, to try and find a solution to something that they just don't know what to do with. Honestly, it's gotten so severe. Thank you. 
Thanks, Pam. So, and I agree with all of you too. I, um, I, I, I don't like rules and regulations changing for my minorities or smaller groups and then being pushed onto majority. Like, I don't think this is a solution for the majority of people. So I'm not quite sure where their headspace is here. They're, they are downloading, they wanna make it normal. Um, it's not, um, they want to make sure they're in public spaces so we can all witness this. It's not cool. So um, I agree with everyone. So do we have a resolution? Uh, I just wanted to add, if that's okay, um, that further communication with the uh, medical health officer, Dr. Mallow, um, just in regards to Campbell River and what's being challenged, it's a jurisdictional issue. So within the community charter, there's spheres of concurrent authority respecting certain areas that, you, that requires consultation and one of them is public health. So any bylaw that relates to public health they ask that you consult with the medical health officer and at times they might need approval from the minister. Um, so I just wanted to add that piece. And so he advised that we may want to seek a uh, legal opinion regarding a bylaw creation around, and I'm just sharing <laughs> passing along the information, um, but just so that you're aware of that piece. Well, go ahead Ian. I'd say this is not public health, this is public safety. I mean, my answer to, to his, that this is a public health thing. No, it's a public safety thing. I mean, they've went and they've decided to decriminalize it. That's fine. That's their choice. What we're saying is here's some rules. And, and I think that's well within, I mean, if that goes to court, I'd be more than happy to stand behind defending that principle for municipalities. Kelly, did you want to make a comment? No, no, no. Siobhan? Through the chair, thank you. Um, I think the other thing maybe we can look at is getting a hold of Campbell River or Enderby and some of the other small communities. And, you know, maybe if it's going to be challenged that we go back and say, hey, there's a group of us that that, that we need some regulations in our towns. And, and these are, you know, our community, our towns, we want to run it in a certain way. But if, if, Every town's going in as an individual may not have the same voice if, um, you know, Sycamus reaches out to some of the other towns that are, are facing this and, and um, trying to put some guardrails in. Um, so you know. just as an FYI, I have reached out to other mayors and have had nothing come back. Okay. So, you know what, we don't need to do what everyone's doing. No. Sycamus can do Sycamus. So I think that, I think we have a pretty good um, plan. Go ahead, Scott. So uh, would council like us to go back to the drawing board and create another bylaw that covers all public spaces? So not just parks. Gord? Oh, I agree. I agree we should. And, and I know we want to go, I'd like to go first and second reading tonight too, just to get the ball rolling, but yeah. we should include all spaces. We do. I, 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 I agree. Well, go ahead. sorry. Go ahead, Malcolm. Thank you, Third Chair. Maybe we can do first and second reading as in as is, just to show our intent, and then uh, give staff a chance to um, incorporate the all public spaces into the third reading. So, and then when we have a second reading, that'll be a tool that we can engage Interior Health Officer with. Say, here's where we're going. We feel that before third reading, there might be amendment to include all spaces. So, I think we should get going on it. Yeah. We can change it as we go. Ian? Yeah, I was gonna say exactly the same thing, that I think we can pass what is done tonight, but signal the intent to include all public spaces uh, that'll come out in our final reading. But yeah, I am I think it's important for us to do, you know, make a strong, signal here that that we need we need some rules around this and this is for the betterment of this is for the protection of everybody in our community absolutely okay so where are we at what do we do uh, is there a motion to do to proceed with first second and third reading of the bylaw or do first second, first, first, second. second. Okay. okay so can we get a motion to sure. ian second bob all those in favor Opposed? Discussion? <laughs> Carried. Great. It's okay. I'm sure you'd have jumped in. Okay, so we're good on that. 
Um, thanks, Scott. Um, recommendation of the District of Sycamus Street Naming and Civic Addressing Bylaw Number 1026-2023 be given first, second, and third reading. Scott, do you want to take that away? And thank you. Give me all the hot topics. Now. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so this is a, a bylaw to regulate um, street naming and civic addressing. Um, some of we, there are two existing bylaws. Um, both of them are are pretty bare and uh, pretty old and um, don't really serve the the purpose. Also, there was a policy um, street naming policy PW eighteen that was um, amended um, last year, I believe, and um, and that bylaw had some. Uh, conventions for for naming of streets and things and I think it um, that was used um, for the naming of parks and then we kind of lost some of the the street naming language from that so this is a bylaw that essentially replaces um, our two existing street naming bylaws and then adds in that language for the naming of uh, parks and, and our streets um, <clears throat> and then um, also we have the there's the ng911 um, and the BC Road Atlas, um, two kind of provincially um, controlled uh, uh, things that this kind of lines up more with some of those initiatives. Um, I don't know, it's not terribly exciting, but um, it, it might just help uh, us do our, our job a little bit when we're, we are looking at um, naming streets. It gives us a clear idea of how to, how to name streets. Um, when a street name, we, we come up with, you know, if, if someone wants a, a street named after someone important in the community or something from the past, then um, provide some guidelines for that, um, guidelines on which, which type of streets are named what. And um, yeah, it's just uh, a little bit of uh, housekeeping to, to keep rolling as we um, entertain development applications and as people come up with uh, with ideas for for naming streets and things, then it's some council can can follow. Council, any comments? Go ahead, Bob. Oh no, I was going to make the motion. Okay. Second. Gord. Discussion. <laughs> I do have a quick question. I don't know if I maybe I didn't see it in here. Um, is can you say no? Can and who say somebody no? comes to you and says, I want this street named? Can you say no, it just doesn't work for the community, or it's just like um, Colleen Anderson Main Street now? <laughs> so essentially council will always have the, the final say on what, what something's named. Um, so if someone a developer is creating a new street, so if um, like an example would be Parksville. Um, we gave the opportunity, said, you know, do you want to put some names forward? They they didn't have any names. Um, so then we brought it to the Planning Development Committee. We kind of went with the tree names and Willow Row and things like that. Um, and then that was essentially adopted by council. So it'd be the same process. They kind of get the first shot to, to name it. And then council has the, the final say. Okay. All right. Any other discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. All right, fire department updates. Staff report, who's fire department? Brett. Thank you. Um, so uh, today we're just giving you a quick update on the, the last two months of uh, Sickles Fire Department and a little bit of uh, you know what's going on with the Providing the community with fire protective services and uh, rescue services. Uh, we're at 17 members within our fire department. Uh, we hope to join. That's uh, very helpful. Um, of course, it includes officers, drivers, uh, support staff as well. Uh, all of our members are currently paid on call, with the exception of myself, as a full time. Uh, for 2022, we had uh, 89 calls, which is Pretty much be in line with a, a normal year. Uh, we've had years where we've had over 100 and uh, years where we've had less than 70. So it's a bit of a, a normal year. Uh, members uh, currently are notified via a pager system or our phone app who's responding. And uh, that just allows us to have flexibility of having an option if our pager system goes down and also a backup to our pager system. Uh, 
training is conducted on Tuesday nights, uh, at least two hours, sometimes more. Uh, very rarely even less. Uh, we have a, a good crew that's very interested in doing that training. Uh, we do provide some training on weekends, so certain courses uh, are not provided by the fire department or, or run by the fire department, so those are held on weekends. And uh, again, I've got commitment from the three to, to participate in those. Uh, we are currently training down at PA 1001, which is the full certification level. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is a, an important level for us to try and attain. Um, our more senior membership who have completed their 1001 are now working towards their uh, NFPA 1002, which is a pump operator certification. And uh, again, this is being all done in those with the exception of the examination which are uh, provided for us by Viera. There's a cost for those, of course. Um, we also encourage our members to participate in the additional training. So uh, wildland firefighting courses, uh, hazardous materials, structural protection, uh, swift water and ice rescue are all courses that are not part of our regular curriculum as far as the NFPA certification. Uh, so for the last few months, uh, rather than, it's not really a quarterly update, it's kind of, uh, but it is does show the last three months. Uh, we wanted to include December because it was a particularly busy month. So if you look at the table quickly there, um, you see that uh, also large beginning to be our biggest uh, volume generator, fortunately. It's a little disappointing that you're not making up for the information. So each month has a few of each few of those. Uh, local fires, not a ton of those. Mutual aid, uh, one that was in Malawa, uh, or a vehicle incident uh, on Groom Bridge, not unusual for that. Um, and then a couple other uh, other calls as well. Just detailed a little briefly here. Uh, so uh, early December, uh, signal from arrows. Um, they've been having some fairly serious issues with their uh, alarm system, and uh, they did get that sorted out. And unfortunately, somebody forgot to make a phone call while they were testing their new town. So we get a false alarm for that one. Signal's landfill. Uh, Warren was quite. Um, had some challenges with that particular landfill fire because of the amount of smoke and uh, uh, ashes that was generated from that. Um, they decided that they didn't want us to assist them with the extinguishment, which is kind of too bad because I think we would have done a much quicker and better job. And I don't think we'll give them the option. Okay. Yeah. We supported Alpha with a, a fairly good sort of structure fire. Unfortunately, it's a full lot by the time we were notified and everybody was out there. But uh, we did assist them with the cleanup and, and fire fighting. Uh, Sequence Haven had a number of calls. I got the bulk of those fire calls in December. Um, typically, an, an organization is given three free fire call uh, false alarms, and then we start targeting them. Uh, the challenge that we had with the Haven was um, we weren't able to identify what the problem was. They had the alarm company come in multiple times, so it wasn't like they weren't trying to fix it. It ended up being a, a, a brand new panel in January that uh, was required to be replaced. So they didn't finally get that sorted, but it meant a lot of calls. Uh, the Broom Bridge call was a motor vehicle incident where the vehicle hit a concrete barrier. Um, Eagle River Secondary, that was an early morning Christmas day. That was interesting. Uh, they had a mine break under the uh, gymnasium. Fortunately, it didn't cause any damage to the gymnasium and uh, it didn't flood out the, uh, the cafeteria area. Uh, so we were quite fortunate there. Uh, Sickles Manor had a false alarm, uh, unknown as to what the cause was. Uh, in the evening, all the residents were in bed, but Anyway, uh, and then again, Haven had some more false alarms in uh, January, but the, the panel did seem to fix that. They haven't had any on there since. Uh, Chestnut Road had a motor vehicle incident where uh, basically a, a resident missed the corner and came across and ran into a crossing gate for that particular thing. It would have been awfully expensive. It was a nice vehicle as well. Uh, Swanson Point, we assisted them with their, their successful ice rescue. Um, 
She fought back to uh, structure fire, so that was a uh, total loss structure fire of a relatively new garage. I think it was just finishing up uh, some of the, the inspection portions of it. But, uh, and he did eat Paul Barn from the building that cleaned up. I actually, I, I have a question for you on that one, if I may, because um, yeah, our, our alarm went off, but then our security company called us and we yeah. said, no, no problem. It's a false alarm. Yeah. So then did they still send a code to you? Yeah. So what happens in that instance is the alarm goes off. The alarm company automatically contacts. Oh, okay. So you could be on the phone and they're already getting that lot of so as soon as you call in, they contact our dispatch, or dispatch contacts us, and we send a second page to say, can't wait, you don't have to leave. Right, yeah. Yeah, it was a very smoky uh, event. It was done with lots of people. Okay. Sorry. What's interesting is we've had fire alarm companies going to testing alarm systems and uh, still get alerted because they phoned in and they made the right calls and whoever was on the alarm button they pushed the alarm didn't get the message or something. We're not quite sure. Uh, Sigma Square Department uh, is we continue to recruit and train new members and uh, we try to prepare them as much as we can for a response and uh, we try to make that space as efficient as possible. And uh, yeah, any of the calls that we may be called to. Uh, just from a communications information, uh, we do provide updates through our Facebook page. So if you're uh, Facebook, you can always like our Facebook page and you'll get uh, generally the most recent stuff that happens community wise. Um, not everything goes on to the Facebook page, especially the false alarms. Um, and then it's also there on our website. Uh, and aligned with strategic priorities is uh, the fire protection plan number 12. And our options receive this information. Excellent. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions for Brett? Go ahead, Gord. Thank you, Stephen Chair. Thank you, uh, Corey. Yeah, thanks, Brett. Um, really want to for the 70 years. I mean, I know you haven't done it for 70 years, but your department uh, for protecting the community. And uh, we really appreciate all the all the work you guys have done. And uh, thanks for helping out at the uh, dump fire there. That went on for a couple months, I think, almost a couple months. And uh, they just didn't want to add water and they just let it smolder. And, yeah. and, and you probably didn't notice it maybe where everybody else lives, but when you're close to the dump and uh, like the neighbors at Man Road and the people at Two Mile were calling me, uh, a few people were calling me, asking when it was going to get put out. And I kept telling them to call the CSRD, which I should have actually told them to call you. And uh, it might have got put out because, uh, yeah, it's, it, I mean, I, it's some one week I couldn't even wear my clothes in the house. That's so, that's how bad it is. It just, and it gets in your vehicle. And it just, it was like creosote. It was like creosote burning, you know. So, anyways, thanks for finally getting them to put it out. Yeah, I was a little surprised on that particular call because they told me that they had fire noise. So I went out to look at it. And I said, well, we'll send a truck out the process. I said, no, no, we're going to deal with it ourselves and we're going to hire a lot of trucks. Okay, that's an unusual response to the fire department who was just down the street. I'm not going to deal with it. I probably could have done that day or what, three weeks later? Oh, so longer than that. Dude. Yeah, probably longer than that because they had some breaks on Christmas. Not, not what I would call it here. And they did have the cold weather, which the water truck froze up or something happened there a couple of times. So, uh, yeah, they they just didn't didn't want to put it out for some unknown reason and just smoldered and they kept turning it every day and it, it would fire up and stink really bad. And then it almost go out and then they turn it again and it would start stinking really bad for two or three more days. Anyone else? Hey, Brett, thanks for all you do. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Thanks, Chief. Um, okay, moving on. Recommendation that Council repeal Occupational Health and Safety Policy Number PW24 and replace it with the District of Sycamore Safety Policy Number A32. Daryl. 
Sure. 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 Uh, so P24 has, has been a guiding document for public works health and safety. It's uh, just a general statement that guides our, our safety plan. Uh, it's been through a few audits. It's, it's a decent document. We've got some new people on the Occupational Health and Safety Committee, and we're looking to branch out and get public works as well as City Hall Incorporated, as well as Fire Hall into our safety program. So uh, I'm recommending that we uh, make this policy more inclusive of the whole organization rather than just public works. Any discussion? We can make a motion that we adopt it. Okay, got that. Any discussion? All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Okay, community service grant agreement and policy update. Um, do you want me to read the recommendations for Ms. Bianca? Sure. Uh, recommendation that council authorize the mayor and corporate office to execute the agreement with the Shushwap Community Foundation to administer and operate the community service grant program on behalf of the district of Sycamus. Recommendation that council adopt the amendments to the community service grant policy F-1. And recommendation that council authorize the Shushwap Community Foundation to offer a second cycle of the 2023 community service grant as funds remaining are greater than $10,000. Take it away. Right. Um, so we had a little discussion back on the January 25th finance committee meeting. So I took council's discussion there and have put together um, these draft agreement and policy. Um, and the big things that um, staff took from that finance committee meeting was a desire to move the application deadline from the um, August 31st and to move it back to October 31st to give community groups an extra two months to get in their applications, figure out their budget budgets and all of that. And that better aligns also with the foundation and when they can meet. Um, our second point, clarification needed on a review process. Um, if someone were to want to review the foundation's decisions. And third, a potential availability for a second round of grant applications should there be funds remaining. So with that from the finance committee, um, I've made some changes to the agreement. Um, the agreement, I would say the policy is the, has the meat and potatoes. The agreement is just our agreement with Shushua Community Foundation. The policy, they go hand in hand. Um, so the big changes to the agreement are a couple date changes um, just on when the grant committee meeting um, meets. So it's getting moved from November 15th to November 30th. Um, the decision now pushing back just to um, for that change in application deadline. So from November 30th to December 15th. Um, also, the, our council's deadline to appoint someone onto the committee. It used to be August 31st, pushing back to October. Um, and then also currently our the grant committee is made up of um, elected official as appointed. So currently um, Councillor Rich, um, a resident of the district who is appointed by the mayor, and then two directors of the foundation who are residents of the district and who um, represent the district on the board of the foundation. So right now at that point, there's only one current director from Sycamus on the foundation board. So I um, put an additional point there that if there is less than two, council can appoint a resident open to council to appoint to put on that board so that we can keep it at five. Cause I mean, getting below five, you, you want a good amount, a decent amount of people to represent. And council can decide, you know, four is okay for this round or whatever, but just to keep that open so that it should council want to bring it up to that five, they can. Um, and knowing that right now the foundation is actively looking for 
to fill those seats. Um, the one seat that currently is filled is going to be um, looking to get, get filled again in October. So we might be down two seats. So just having it in there, if those seats are not filled, council can appoint to fill them. Um, that's clear. It doesn't have to be today, though. It doesn't have to be today. So I, that's why I haven't put in a recommendation. We could sit on it. Um, if we choose the third recommendation to do a, a second cycle, council can, at the next meeting, whenever they can appoint to fill that fifth seat, if, if council deems it's necessary. Um, and then, yeah, and then the other, making up the five, there is a member of the foundation staff that sits on it. Um, so those are the changes for the agreement, draft agreement, and then the policy um, is really meat and, meat and potatoes, I would say, of everything. Um, one big change is just the formatting, kind of just brought it, brought it up to date um, and consistent with district, our normal district policies. Um, on page two, we've included a timeline in table format, so it's just very clear of um, all those key dates. So um, date changes, like I've already said, first cycle application date um, moved to, the, to October 31st with all the other dates adjusted. And then pulling you a second cycle. So right now um, we have over 30,000 that weren't allocated out this last cycle. So um, cycle was brought in applications due end of August for 2023, we have over 30,000 left. So with council's approval today, we can, the foundation is ready to send out those applications and council can start, you know, anyone you know within the community, you can push them that, push them their way. They're ready to go for that. Um, so second cycle. So with council's approval, it would be open until April 15th. Um, the grant committee would make their decision and checks would be out by May 15th. So pretty second cycle is going to be a, a quicker turnaround. It would be great. And uh, putting, going forward, if um, funds remaining are over 10, um, it could be a council decision right away and foundation's ready for it. And council can say, yep, yeah, ready to go by February 28th. And we can get a second cycle going going forward with the 10,000, um, just if we have like five grand, it really does not, not enough meat and potatoes to, it can carry forward to the next year. Um, and then big change, uh, 0.2.4 has just been added and it's just talking about um, if there's unexpected um, changes in an applicant's um, expenditures, that they contact the foundation and get approval before spending the money on something other than what their application says, get that approval, approval ahead of time. Standard there. And then the last point, um, point 3.4, um, that should there be a request for review, that request for review would come to the mayor and the person on the committee to discuss and then they decide how to proceed. So bring it to council or if it's a review that you you can just give your final sign off and not bring it back to a council meeting. Um, yeah, so it's a lot. I don't know if I talk as fast okay. as Charlie and Kelly. <laughs> just I like to take your Foundation of Council authorizes the mayor and corporate officer to execute the agreement with the Shishova Community Foundation to administer and operate the community service grant program on behalf of the district of Sycamus. Can I get a mover? Ian, second. Siobhan, any discussion? All in favor? Carried. Uh, second one, recommendation that council adopt the amendments of the community service grant policy F-1. Can I get a mover? Gord, second. Malcolm, any discussion? All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Recommendation that council authorize the Shoeshop Community Foundation to offer a second cycle for the 2023 Community Service Grant as funds remaining are greater than 10 grand. 
Mover, Siobhan. Second, Malcolm. Any discussion? All in favor? Carried. <laughs> Good job, Bianca. All right, moving along. Recommendation that the district authorize an issue development permit number 21-4248-DP for the property legally described as Strata Lot 2, Section 36, Township 21, Range 8, West of the 6th Meridian, Kamloops Division, Yale District Strata, Strata Plan, KAS 2057, located at 393 Coach Road for retaining walls and landscaping. Scott, do you want to take that away? And thank you, Mayor Anderson. <clears throat> so this is an application for a development permit. And as you can see by the number, it's 21248. So that was way back in 2021 that they, they made the application, probably closer to the end of the year. Um, <clears throat> it stops recommending that this development permit be issued. And um, so it's for this property, you can see uh, 393 Coach Road, and then the, the black outline is the, the property boundary. So this um, photo was probably taken in 2018 prior to any development of the property. Um, the, uh, the owner um, built two retaining walls, did some landscaping, and they built a single family dwelling on the property. Um, staff became aware that uh, of what was happening and recommended that um, they go through the repairing areas protection regulation process. But because the work was already done, it makes the process much longer, much more complicated. And it's uh, they're, they're required to do what's called a condition and impact assessment. So you're kind of going back, looking at what it would have been like before and how to make it um, right again. They hired the, the, the um, qualified environmental professional and they came up with a, a landscaping plan for the property. Um, <clears throat> here you can see the kind of the result of the assessment. So they had the, recess, uh, the assessment area. And um, so that's the green, and then the one wall is completely within that area, and half of the other wall is, is not within the area, and the house is actually outside of the, the assessment area. Um, so the QEP, Ecotope Consulting Services, they came up with um, a list of conditions to uh, do some planting and um, ensure that everything's returned to, to what it was like before. And, um, and then they submit that to the, the province for approval. Um, <clears throat> staff, um, uh, sent it out for referrals and um, we did get um, some response. Um, Splatson uh, said there is an outstanding archaeological site issue. So um, if you look at the, if everybody remembers the, the map of 200 Main, you saw the, the red uh, polygon. So there is there is a, a red polygon in close proximity to this property as well. Um, not on this property, I believe it's just off this property, but um, it's an area that, um, you know, everybody should be aware that if they're doing any work and they find anything, they have to notify the proper authorities. It's a lot easier to, do, to start the process. And if you find something, you're already in the queue and it makes things go faster. Um, <clears throat> but that, that was not done. It certainly wasn't done at the building stage. And I don't believe it's been, been done at the, the, um, the planting stage either. Um, Ministry of Forest Lands and Natural Resources operate Natural Resources and Rural Development, as they were called at the time. Um, they they recommended that uh, the QEP go through the the RAR process, which has been done. Um, the rail trail, because it is it, some of the work did go over onto the rail trail, like a lot of the area has been disturbed on on the rail trail. Um, <clears throat> they they just had no development in the rail trail and. Uh, just the rail trail would, would be protected during the, the replanting and then the future runoff wouldn't have any issues. Uh, Planning and Development Com Committee, this is in June of 2022, recommended approval and we had no objections or concerns from anyone else. Um, in the end, this is going to be a benefit when they do complete the landscaping. It's going to be a benefit to what was there previously. The work was already done um, and staff's recommending that uh, this development permit be issued. Thank you. Any questions, Council? Okay, let's call the question. Oh, and mover. <laughs> Recommend that the district of Second was authorize an issue uh, development variance permit 23046 DVP for the property legally described as lot one, section five. I'll work my way back up here, sorry. Recommendation that the district authorize and issue permit, development permit number 21248 DP for the property legally described as strata lot two, section 36 township 21 range eight, 
of the 6th Meridian, Kamloops Division, Yale District. Um, Strata Plan KAS 2057, located at 393 Coach Road for retaining walls and landscaping. Do I have a mover? Ian, second, Gord. Any discussion? All in favor? Carried. Okay, moving on. Uh, development variance permit application number 23046, DVP 1833, Steep Pet Road. Scott, do you want to, before I read the recommendation, do you want to, uh, so I don't have to read it twice? Do you want to? Yeah. You can do that. Um, I got it now. <laughs> so this is an application for a development variance permit, permit on Step Pit Road to reduce this. Uh, setback from interior sideline from three meters to 2.52 meters and staff's recommending that uh, the development variance permit be issued. Um, <clears throat> so this property is out on Step Pit Road. Um, the, the west boundary of this property is actually the west boundary of the, the district. Um, if you continue up Step Pit Road, I believe it's uh, old Ministry of Transportation Pit that is now the home of the Snowmobile Club. Um, so right now, the, this was part of a larger property. It was subdivided off, and um, and probably that building was um, not on the pro was on the property when it's subdivided. Um, typically, people have to have a, a single family dwelling or a use on the property before they can have an accessory building. So I think that's how that accessory building ended up being kind of orphaned from the, the rest of the property. You can kind of see where the uh, 1833 is. That's a bench, and then it slopes off quite a bit down onto the other side of the property. The owners would eventually like to, to build a house on the property. Um, they're using it right now for recreational purposes, and then they have a kind of a hobby, hobby farm out there right now, and they'd like to expand the, the shop to the east. Um, the property is rural in the rural land use designation and is country residential. It's also within the agricultural land reserve. Um, <clears throat> so the setbacks in the country residential um, zone are three meters and the existing building is 2.52 meters at its closest point or the, the lean to is. Um, and they just want to fill in that lean to and build a, a bathroom and a little bit of a kitchen and, um, and continue to use the property. Um, so we, you know, like I said, they should really have a single family dwelling to have an accessory building or a use. So we're saying agriculture is probably the, the uh, principal use, and then this would be the accessory use. Um, here you can see this is a picture taken from Step Pit Road. You can see the little area they fill in. And then uh, this is just at the back of the property. Um, you just see the fence post where my the arrow is right now. That's where the fence post is. So that'd be the property line, and they, they want to fill in. Uh, so you can see kind of the, the setback from the property line there. Um, we did send this out for um, uh, referrals. The building inspector, they did apply for a building permit. So that's how we became aware of the, the, the idea. Um, they actually had originally uh, asked about building the single family dwelling, but they want to do this first. And uh, yeah, there are no objections from uh, any of the other departments. And again, I think this is a positive. Somebody wants to improve the property, eventually build a single family dwelling. Um, this will help them get there and staff's recommending that it be issued. Awesome, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna read the recommendation that the District of Sycamore is authorized and issue development variance permit number 23046 DVP for the property legally described as lot one, section five, township 22, range seven, west of the six meridian, Camelot's division, Yale district plan, EPP 47897, located at 1833 Step Road to Vary Sycamus' zoning bylaw number 1000, 2022, section 4.2.1.6, minimum setbacks for buildings and structures for interior parcel lines from three meters to 2.52 for an additional, uh, for addition to the existing accessory building on the property. Can I get a mover? Thanks, Bob. Second, Siobhan. Any discussion? All those in favor? Buried. Okay, moving on. Development permit number 23-027-DP and development variance permit number 23-027-DVP-1226 Young Crescent. Scott. Thank you. 
Yeah, I understand. So this is an application for a development permit and a development variance permit. Um, staff's recommending that both those be issued. Um, <clears throat> so here you can see the property, um, 1226 Young Road. It's the, the Hatch property. A little bit of a unique property where there is, uh, it's, they actually have the, the title to the, the entire property and it goes out a little bit. It was likely filled into the lake. So it comes out a little bit further. So it's unique where um, some of these properties would need a, a license or something, but this is actually titled property and it goes out beyond the, the high water mark. Um, the owner, I believe, was required. Sorry, Scott is here. He's the, the owner of the property. Um, he was directed by the province to uh, replace his retaining wall. It was failing. And um, we've probably been working with him for over a year now, probably came in in November of 2021. Um, and we've been having discussions and um, we talked about the, the, the wall, um, the flood protection wall along there. Um, and, and really the timing wasn't going to help him to, uh, to get his wall built. Um, and he applied for a, a section 11 per permit from the province to do work within the, the water course. So the difference between the preparing areas regulation and then the, the water act is he's actually on the water side of the high water mark where the preparing area regulations applies to the, the land side. So he's actually going through a, another provincial process, not the, the repairing area regulation process. Um, here you can see the, the property. It's in the, the town center OCP designation. It's zoned C3. And then the, the water side would be zoned uh, W3, which is, I think, uh, commercial waterfront. Um, <clears throat> here's a drawing of the, the wall that he'd like to uh, build. He's, he's actually started construction, so he's got a, a pretty tight fish window to get this wall done. And, um, and then you can see the, the wall, I think it's 30 meters long, covers the front of the property, four and a half meters high. Um, so the conditions of the, the development permit would be that, you know, essentially that, you know, he builds it as the engineer says he's supposed to build it, and he follows the rules of the Section 11 permit that the, the province issued. And then the, the variance, because the it's right on the property line, um, essentially you'd have to vary the setbacks from the property lines where you can see the arrows from two meters to zero meters and then vary the height of the wall. So um, our bylaw says a height, uh, a wall over a certain height has to be, um, can only be 1.2 meters, sorry. And, uh, and, and he's going to 4.5 meters for the wall. So those are the, the variances. Here you can see a picture. Um, this was taken probably in 2021, probably in the in November or something, 2021. You can see it's a Gabian basket wall. They're not really designed for use in wet areas. Um, although you see them all over creeks and stuff. So I don't know why they keep using them. Um, but uh, yeah, when we were out there, you could see the wall was failing. Um, and um, yeah, the, the province recognized that and asked to have it uh, replaced. And uh, I believe this picture was taken um, probably this year sometime, two weeks ago. Um, so the, the work has already started on the wall. Um, a building permit uh, will be required. Um, and basically, it's an engineered building, so it's really just the engineering saying it was built as they, they said it would be built. Uh, we did refer this out to the different agencies. Um, we did send it out to Splatson. Um, they recommended uh, they had environmental, culture, and archaeological concerns, um, and then um, also they wanted to ensure that erosion and water, water, water quality protection was required. Um, so there is um, all that in place through the Section 11 permit. Um, it would have been referred to First Nations as well through the, the Section 11 permit by the province. Um, we did refer it as well. Um, and, um, and we're, we're sure that the, the erosion and the water quality protection issues have been addressed. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, no other concerns from uh, the departments. And um, yeah, staff's recommending that uh, this the development permit, the development variance permit be issued. It's something that needed to be done and um, should be done, needs to be done by end of March, I think. And uh, hope it gets done. May 13th. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, recommendation that council authorize and issue development permit number 23-027-DP to permit development of a shoreline wall and development variance permit number 23-027-DVP to vary the maximum height of the re retaining wall from 1.2 meters to 4.5 meters and vary the minimum setback 
for the retaining wall from zero meters to, or from two meters to zero meters for the property legally described as lot A, district lot 452, township 21, range eight, west of the six meridian and the district lot 6305 Kamloops, division, Yale division, plan KAP 48998, located at 1226 Young Street. Can I get a mover, Gordo? Seconded by Bob. <laughs> Any discussion? Love it. Go ahead, Malcolm. Yeah, I, I might have missed it in the application process there, but uh, when you move from 1.2 meters to four, whatever it is, 4.5, then that moves from just a, a wall to a structure. So I'm just my question, I guess, is, is there an engineering uh, sign off on the structure? Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, let's call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. That's right. Uh, late item. Which one are we at? Oh, zoning amendment application number 23051 Z 926 C Frontage Road. That would be a Scott. Thank you, Mayor Anderson. Um, Trina Gill might be online. I'm not sure. So she might be available to, uh, to answer questions. So this is a zoning amendment uh, to amend the, the zoning bylaw to have a special regulation for a um, so right now on Sea Fronted Road, there's an RV. There's a little business selling rubber mats right next to the Cedar Product Company, and uh, they would uh, they'd like to put a mobile home there as the employee dwelling unit. Um, <clears throat> so here you can see the the property. It's uh, a London Gray, um, right next to the, the Sick New Cedar Products, and um, council issued a uh, temporary use permit. I believe it was in 2021. Um, and that was so they can have our, an RV on the property. At that time, they were they were working for the um, Cedar Product Company, and then they were also um, they also have their rubber mat company and a lawn maintenance company. So the the temporary use permit was to allow for uh, a mobile home to be used as a, a residence on the property. Now, want to upgrade that mobile home in or sorry, an RV. They now want to upgrade that RV into a mobile home. Uh, so the property is uh, commercial uh, highway commercial and uh, zone C2, which is highway commercial. Um, <clears throat> so and void dwelling unit is a permitted use in that uh, highway commercial zone. So um, void dwelling unit, I think everybody understands what that is. Someone who works for the company or owns the, the, the business. Um, and uh, employee dwelling unit, one of the rules is it has to be part of the commercial building. So a second floor or you know, a, a building, uh, a unit kind of attached to the building behind the building can exceed 25% of floor area of the, the buildings on the parcel. Um, and um, right now there are no, there's, I think there's just one small kind of utility shed on the, the, the property. Um, so this amendment would uh, give them some assurance that if they do invest in the, the mobile home, that uh, with the temporary use permit, it's only good for three years and can be stand by three years. So this would give them assurance that they, if they move this mobile home onto the property, they're not gonna have to move it in five years. And um, they, uh, they would have to get a, a development permit. So there was an existing development permit. So maybe we'll look at that development permit and see if it lines up, everything lines up with the mobile home and they're just moving the RV out. We might be able to get away with not issuing a development permit. But um, <clears throat> yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see how it works. Um, but yeah, right now staff's recommending that uh, this bylaw get first and second reading. The next step would be we'll continue referrals. Did come to the Planning and Development Committee. They recommended that it, uh, it move forward. And, um, and then we'll uh, do the notifications for the bylaw amendment and it'll come back before council at uh, public hearing. Okay, so I'll read the recommendation. Uh, the council gives zoning amendment by law 1030 2023 first and second reading to amend the C2 highway commercial use to add a site specific 
regulations detached employee dwelling unit located at the property legally described as lot three, section six, township 22, range seven, west of the sixth meridian, Kamloops division of Yale district, plan 6294 located at 926 Seed Frontage Road. Could I get a mover? Thanks, Gord. Thanks, Ian. Any discussion? Okay, I'll call the question all in favor. Opposed, carried. Okay, so notices of motion. So we have letter to the premier decriminalization. Councillor Bailey, do you want to give us a little share some thoughts? Sure, I, I guess it's just a continuation of what we've talked about tonight about our bylaw is, you know, we've expressed our concerns here and this would just be to formalize our concerns to the province saying we wish that they would go back and take a look at some provincial wide uh, rules for decriminalization and the use of the product as they go through this next three years. So that's, that's kind of the point of the letter is to I said, formally inform the government of kind of our thoughts here, really. Anyone else want to add to that? Go ahead, Malcolm. Is your intent to have the letter state that we've got second reading of a bylaw we're thinking about implementing? Uh, yeah, it might even be that we pass the bylaw, depending on when that letter would get sent out. Um, but I, I think the intent of the letter would be to do what our bylaw is doing, putting some rules around decriminalization. It's not too late for the province to actually take forward some sensible approach in terms of putting some guardrails around this. I mean, it's, it's a three year um, experiment that they're trying to do. Um, I, I suspect they're gonna have to do this eventually. I think what we're a little bit ahead of uh, and being a little more forward looking and what we're saying to them is basically, please do the same. And I think it's, it's gonna be um, something that they're gonna get to anyways. Okay, go ahead, Malcolm. So Kelly read out earlier on our community charter whether we had the authority to actually implement the bylaw and Campbell River is being challenged. So maybe that letter we could uh, suggest that it is implemented or we're in the middle of implementing it and we uh, request their su support on the implementation of it, the enforcement of it. It sort of be proactive and instead of them coming and saying challenging us. Sure. I agree. And we're seeing our concerns as a community. Yeah. Anyone else? Sarah, do you have enough to make some magic happen? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> do we want to do a resolution that the count yeah. directing staff to draft the letter? Okay. Just to make it formal so we can track it, it's it's just easier. <laughs> Ian, you want to take that? Actually, sure. uh, make a motion to direct staff to draft a letter to the premier outlining, um, I guess, our concerns as per decriminalization. Perfect. Second. One second. Any more discussion? All in favor? Carrie. Um, Oh, sorry, you're not in favor. No, 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 no. <laughs> I just wanted to say that if, if you would like, then once we've drafted up a letter, we can bring it back to council to have a look at before we send it out. So we make sure we're capturing all your thoughts. We'll share it with you. Or you want us to just go ahead and send it? No, do you want to just email it to us? Yeah. Have a peek and we can give you a little bit of feedback. And that'll that's totally the, fine. The process moved just a little bit quicker. I'm good with that. Okay. Yeah. Malcolm? Well, it makes sense because we're in second reading of that bylaw and with the intent of changing it to include public spaces. So the two will run parallel paths. So by the time you get that letter, maybe we'll have third reading or final reading on, on the bylaw. Okay. Thanks, Malcolm. Yeah, I'm got it. fairly certain we can't be the only community that's got these issues. So, okay, moving on. Um, the Royal... Canadian Marine Search and Rescue Station, number 106, Boathouse location. And I'm going to let um, Councillor Bushel take this away. Thank you, Susan Chair. Um, yeah, I just wanted to let everybody know that I uh, reached out to Daryl and, uh, and uh, the 
uh, society, uh, the boat um, SARS, about the location of the, uh, the boathouse. We we were concerned that uh, we were, you know, of course it was going to stick out way past our past our tenure. But actually, we decided that maybe I'd call, see if I could get everybody down on the dock, and we could just have a look at it. And that foreshore is kind of unique, where it is actually the right now the water is probably the lowest I've ever ever seen it, and there's still like two feet of water there, and uh, and it's now the water's starting to come back up. But if you look at the if if you look at this, we were talking about actually putting that, and I don't have my pointer. We were looking at putting it out in the tenure line here, which would stick out. So we talked about removing slips, and that's probably not a good thing to do is remove slips when we have the steps in the panel. But I noticed that the, that the boat launch, uh, the ramp that comes down here, and this part of the dock here, these fingers here for the dragon boat could be moved in a little bit, just a little bit. And that would allow room for these fingers here to be moved here and here, so we wouldn't lose any steps. And then we put the, the boathouse in here. We'd end up with this extra piece of dock, which could be used, utilized anywhere. Because um, there's still a lot of room in here. And if you notice this boathouse here, this would go into the, the society as well. They don't know what they're going to do with it. They'd like to put it in, in a spot. But this whole area in here is, it would end in here with most. This, this one here and another one, if you wanted to put one over here and one here, but there's still room out here if you slip. So the only way to do this is actually to uh, engage with the QEP. And uh, so the society is going to engage with uh, QEP, the Western, Western, well, I can't remember the name, the article of Vernon, I think. Anyway, so they're going to consult with the QEP and, uh, and then they're going to bring it back to council. So that's kind of where we're at right now. But we should, um, if we're going to do that, um, Todd has talked to Keith Weir. Keith Weir says we have to, we will have to uh, initiate a, um, a Section 11 uh, tenure amendment. So that even if we do want to amend it to even come out a bit, where there is room to come out a bit, actually here, we do want to amend it. We could come out just a bit if there's not enough room to put this in between here and this red line. Or, that's not the case that could go in here. And there's a bunch of old pilings that go all the way along here. You could actually pull those pilings out, put new pilings in, and you wouldn't even disturb any, any, uh, any for sure. And you can tie that so here if, if, if we had to. So those are some options, um, but the QED's got to look at it first. So that's kind of where we're at now. So, Gord, are you asking that we make a recommendation that staff look into our tenure? And yeah, I think we should look into our tenure and, and at least start the process uh, of, of Section 11. And it's just an online, it's an online application. And uh, yeah, that's what uh, I think the ball rolling. I mean, for whatever reason, if it got turned down by the province, um, it gets turned down. But I, it's, it's, you got to start the process. So, and this is really key for our community. We are the only inland lake that has a search and rescue boat. And our other option, I mean, they're looking at other places for this and they're complicated. At Old Town Bay, now you're crossing train tracks, you're um, dealing with a, a bottleneck group of traffic there if you do have an emergency that you have to run down. Whereas this is Main Street Landing, right down the landing. It's it's a great, I think it's a great location and it's owned by us. So I think that, uh, I think it's a really good idea and we should uh, carry carry on with it. And Daryl added some other options too. He said we could actually, if we wanted to, we could relocate some of those up, uh, um, upstream fingers um, and move them to the downstream side and put the, run the uh, boathouse along the edge for the, right there, yeah right in there. So we could, there's still room to do all that and also keep the uh, dra two dragon boat slips as well. So there's 16 boat slips there and two dragon boat slips. Do you make a recommendation? So I would make a recommendation that we proceed with uh, uh, section 11. Bob, second it. Any discussion? Malcolm? Unfortunately. <laughs> That's a pretty cool. That's a pretty, you know, blank check. My apologies, Court. Uh, 
proceed with section 11 when you when you go with the section 11 you have to show them what what, what you're up to what you're doing and, and we don't know i i don't think that's fair to council to make a decision without enough information um i don't know how timely this is for windows for you know uh, section 11 windows and stuff but you're asking us for a blank check here to start a section 11 and we don't know how many finger slips we're going to be left with the public boat, uh, boat slips. We don't know where the building's going to be, either front or back. I, 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 and I think some of that's important. Personally, I wouldn't want to give up deep water boat slips to move to shallow water boat slips to accommodate uh, the rescue house. I mean, I support the rescue house and I support looking for a home for them, but we don't have anything to vote on here, in my opinion. The open check. Well, check. you know, I, I mean, he, it, it will be going to Keith Weir, and and he will be the one authorizing it. What will be going? The, the section eleven. What's going to be in section eleven? Well, we can make it. We can give them options. We can give them two options. Council doesn't know what those are. I just say. I just. Well, I just. Yeah, I mean, any any variables that might work. Sort of. It's pretty. I'm sorry. Don't mean to be rude. Pretty wide open there. So I'll prepare something for next council meeting. That's what I'm thinking. Okay. You know, talk to the rescue society. Where do they want it? And how would that look? How many finger slips do we lose from deep water to shallow water? Or do we lose any? We're not going to lose any. Well, you suggested at one point we take the first two and, and put them in the shallow water to accommodate the, so it doesn't encroach over the 10 years. So we could lose deep water slips to shallow water slips. But you could park right there right now. Just an example, sorry, Corey. It's pretty, there's not really much here to make a decision on. Yeah, well, the, the shallowness of the of the channel, every marina on the entire channel suffers from not being able to park in low water. Some, some of them lose their slips in August. This one, we would never lose it. I mean, we don't even lose it now. So when we're in the lowest lo lowest water we've ever been in, so we'll we'll get them to- uh, I support your request, but I'd like to see a little more information. Yes. Okay. Gore, did they, when you went out with the Pat and the group, did they not have a, a, a preference, like where they would like to be? No, they're open. They're, 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 they're at, you know, they're looking for a place to, and, and, and two, Pat even offered up a, even a, a like a, like a, a term, like three years until they, we know what we're doing with our rail trail bridge. You know, it's floating. You can, you can pull it in, you can pull it out. You can move it, you can do it anything, you, you know, you can move it out in five years if we had to put a big pillar in there because we have to uh, have a, you know, we can't use a suspension bridge. So, so would it not be right where it's sitting right now at the end of that dock? Would that not be the best location? It would be the best location for them, but Pat did indicate if we put both of them in, in towards the shore, they would still be able to get in and out of them no problem because there's lots of room there. So one or the other. One or the other. So why don't we put together the outside of the dock there and the inside and not moving any slips? Well, I, I just yeah, if, it's just if a pro time sensitive. If two weeks would give us a little more information to make a decision on. Yeah, we'll do it. We'll get them to do it. No, I can see where you're going because it just this is like the slow moving wheels of QEPs and um, mm -hmm. um, all those folks that go along with that. Go ahead, Bob. So then, uh, are you, do we have to table this because I yeah. seconded it? Well, we're in discussion and we have to go to a vote. Yeah, we can we can defer it or table it or, or... no, we can defer it or we can just table it. It's fine. You don't want to give them two options? Oh, we'll give them two options uh, the next council meeting. Yeah. We'll we'll bring it back the next council meeting. There's no the we can just table it and okay. Kelly? I, I sorry, I just have some uh just a question for Clary. I've never done a section eleven, so I didn't know like how long does it take to do with section eleven? Is there a fee associated with it? Like what is the work associated with preparing and what need <laughs> to complete a section eleven for? For that, yeah, through, through the chair, it, it depends. It depends on you know what area you're you're trying to do something in. This is highly sensitive. 
there's there's a few obstacles with what we're looking at. It's not just the tenure. It's also the NAV line that, that NAV Canada has, that good line. Won't be okay. Is it insurmountable? No, I think there's things that can be done. Uh, you know, what I'm hearing is that uh, Pat is Pat and the group are willing to engage a QEP. And, and I would offer that, you know, if, if they want some assistance from us, get that QEP to maybe define what makes the most sense. So we have something, we can help them as best we can. It, it could be lengthy and it could be expensive, but, you know, depending how it's configured and, and what, we, what we're trying to do. Yeah, and Pat did say they would raise the funds for QEP and and uh, and you know the application. So and you know it's not it's not like it's going to cost the taxpayers a whole bunch of money, but it will. You know it's they it's going to be in the taxpayers you know ten year area. Yeah, and uh, and if we have to we have to put a, together a partnership agreement or a, a lease of some sort, we can do that as well, or they can do that as well. Yeah, no, that's great. I just had no. I've never done one. I don't know the timelines or the fees or requirements and the work associated with putting one together. It's a slow moving machine. It's it works within the works within the water is basically what it is, right? Yeah, exactly. So you have to define what that work is, and we don't know yet. Through the chair for something like this in this area, there'd be a lot of scrutiny on the just on the engineering of the structure itself and how that relates to what we're trying to fasten it to. So they're going to take a close look at the, at the boathouse and a close look at the dock. And then anything that has to be reconfigured, they're going to take a close look at all that stuff. And, you know. So it's a little early for a blank approved for fiction like that. I wouldn't refer to it as blank. It's not costing us any money to move forward and start getting the paperwork going. Like seriously, I mean, the section 11 is going to take over a year and the QEP has got to go to the province and how long does that take? Eight, nine months. So it's just a really, really slow process. It's important to our community. So, and it's being built right now. So there is a bit of um, urgency to, to where they're going to land. Okay. Sarah? So is the most, sorry, the motion to postpone um, until the March 8th meeting yeah. or until a QEP is engaged defining? I think that the QEP should be engaged prior to figure out best case. And as soon as the QEP, which like I said, could be months, then I guess we go to a section 11, depending on um, where the boathouse will land. Mm -hmm. But there's a motion on the floor now. It has to be voted. It's been first, second. It's got some book and needs to get voted on. So is the motion to retract it? Yeah, I think so. Can you, can you just retract it? I'm not an expert. I don't really. Yeah, I think under Robertsville, you can take the motion off. Well, I think the motion to postpone would over. Kelly, is that your understanding? Um, you know what? <laughs> I'm pretty reasonable with whatever. We can just vote against it and then. Let's defeat it. Let's defeat so, it if we want, if that's how it feels, and then we'll then we can do another. We'll once we have the QEP and we know what we're actually gonna put in the section 11, we'll prepare one or have options. Is that the direction we're going? Do we need a motion for a QEP? No, because we're not doing it, they're doing it. Right. Yeah. And then once we know, I think what the QEP says and where it's going, and we don't need provincial approval once the QEP is done, we just need them to kind of outline what makes the most sense and we can plunk that into our section 11 and then move forward. Yeah, so I'm thinking. Okay. Okay, okay so is the motion, sorry, there is a motion to postpone. No, what's the motion we have right here right now? Oh, you want to do that one? Okay. Yep. Uh, so the motion was that uh, staff proceed with a section 11 permit to accommodate the Royal Canadian Marine Search and Rescue Station number 106 Shishwap Boathouse. Um, okay. Why can't we just why can't we just amend that motion? Yeah, and say until the QEP. Yes. Okay. Once the Q QEP is complete. 
Perfect. That's a good idea. Yeah. Perfect. No, no. Okay. Is there any more discussion on that? You can actually vote for it. So voting it down. Perfect. Any more discussion? Just reread the friendly amendment if, if that's your oh. piece, your worship. Uh, staff, that staff proceed with a section 11 permit to accommodate the Royal Canadian Marine Search and Rescue Station, number 106, Shushwap Boathouse. Um, sorry. Once the QEP is complete. Once a qualified environmental professional assessment is complete. Okay. All right. Any more discussion? All in favor? <laughs> Opposed? Carried. Okay. All right. Well, that wasn't hard at all. Okay. So now we're moving on to resolutions. Kind of. So these are the resolutions for SILGA. Correct? Mm -hmm. So, uh, riparian areas, protection, regulation, compliance. I support them all. Do you? Okay. Um, you need to go. Okay. All right. So, does everyone has everyone read these, or do I need to read them? Do you want me to read them? No. Am I that bad? Does I, I have a cold. I think I've read them. I I don't think I need to either read them again. No, your voice is perfect, Adam Mayor. Great job. <laughs> Thanks. So end of the day, therefore, it be resolved that the province grant local governments the authority to accept and review QEP reports that are required for developments within its own jurisdiction. Are we all good with that? Do we need to move these? Or uh, yeah, so I just need to... A, a motion to accept the recommendation. Okay. So can I get a motion? Thanks, Bob, to accept uh, preparing areas, protection, regulation, compliance, seconded by Gord. Any more conversation? Any more chit chat? <laughs> <laughs> I lost the word there. <laughs> okay, all in favor. Okay, carried. All right, greater enforcement for invasive muscle defense program. Therefore, let it be resolved that the province increase funding for the IMDP, expedite the introduction of pull and plug red, uh, legislation, and enact the mandatory watercraft inspections for watercraft entering BC to ensure the protection of our water, water courses. Can I get a mover? Ian, second. Gord, any discussion? So there's only one thing that, um, again, I, I don't like the word um, pull the plug because it's not just pulling the plug, it's clean, drain and dry. Because pulling the plug means that you're pulling the plugs on your engine and you're gonna, you know, or inside your boat or, you know, I mean, there's still room for muscles to hang on. So clean, drain and dry is a water temperature of so many degrees, it's, Clean it out and it's dry it off. I think she's just referring though that that's what the legislation is called. Or, or to the chair, uh, I've engaged with Aaron from uh, she shot watershed and uh, no claims or Mayor Anderson is correct. Uh, it isn't uh, clean, drain, dry, but pull the plug legislation is already um, in motion. And so, from the she watershed council that we've been engaging with, they're they thought that us pre presenting this recommendation or a resolution to the province would have um, more of an effect than um, presenting new legislation. Right. They're not considering clean, drain, and dry currently. I think all so of our resolutions say clean, drain, and dry, and the one that hopefully goes to FCM says clean, drain, and dry on it. That one did, correct. So I don't, so that's made it all the way to the top of the pile. It's not on the cutting <laughs> floor yet. I guess, can we just slash clean, drain, and dry? Like, can we just add it with this? Pull the plug, clean, drain, and dry. Add them both. And that way we're covered. And clean, drain, and dry. It's just, you know, I mean, this it, it's so complicated and it's gonna be so devastating. And it's complicated because it's not just boats, it's paddle boards, it's tubes, it's blow up zodiacs, it's um, float planes. This doesn't even cover that. Like, 
It clean, drain, and dry covers everything, like clean, drain, and dry everything before you move it from one body of water to another. It's like, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm super passionate about oh. this because it's our, it's our business, right? It likes our business. It's so far to tell. No. Can I just make that amendment to the resolution then? To amend. Motion to amend to include clean, drain, and dry after pull the plug. Thank you. Thanks. Nice. And second. Can I have a seconder? Good word. So I'll uh, vote on the all, amendment. All those in favor of the amendment? Carried. Beauty. And then a vote at, on uh, the original. Main motion as amended. All in favor? Oh, do I need a motion on it? No, nope. there already was. Okay, good. Okay, we're good. Perfect. Just an amendment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so there was a. Um, the Kamloops to the Alberta border, highway four laning, which I think um, Sarah has tweaked a few words in it. So with Malcolm's, with Malcolm's um, um, guidance, where it says highway one, he wants it changed to the Trans-Canada Highway. So every highway one is now the Trans-Canada Highway. Through the chair. Uh, so this is a, actually a rewritten version. It's not what's shown up here. Oh, right. Um, so there would need to be a motion to consider this version and then have it read out. Okay. Could I get a motion to consider this version? Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Siobhan. Here, let me read it out. <laughs> okay. Uh, the District of Sikkim is Highway 1 4 laning. Whereas the Trans Canada Highway is BC's primary. Southern East-West Corridor, essential for trade and travel, and the province committed to upgrading the highway to a modern four-lane structure from Kamloops to the Alberta border. And whereas the scope of the RW Broom Bridge project within the District of Sycamore includes 1.9 kilometers of highway, one four-laning and intersection improvements between Old Sycamore Road and Silver Sands Road but does not include a four-lane standard for the remaining section of Trans-Canada Highway arterial. <laughs> Whereas the District of Sycamus remains one of the only communities between Kamloops and the Alberta border that does not have four-laning of the arterial section of our community, the Trans-Canada Highway. Therefore, be it resolved that the province work with the district to conduct a highway corridor access plan for the municipality and commit to funding for the four um, for the arterial design of the four laning of the remaining section of um, highway in uh, Trans Canada Highway in Sycamus. Any discussion? Can I move mover? Oh, oh, did we? Okay. No, I think we just, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Any discussion? No, it's good. good. That's both. That's good? Yeah. All right. All in favor? Nope. Hold the pinch. Okay. There you go. And so as the, sorry, I'm just thinking the, the recommendation that's here on the agenda though. I guess we didn't discuss, we didn't get a mover and seconder, so we can just leave it as is. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay. We, we need this, good. we moved to this one instead. Perfect, okay, thank you. Okay, okay. Hmm. Now let's go over correspondence. We have a request, BC Epilepsy Society. Does anyone want to speak to that? What's the request here? Looks like a proclamation. Mm -hmm. uh, so no one read it. Purple shirts. Sometimes purple. I was going to read it. Um, absolutely, epilepsy is one of the most common neurological conditions. However, it's been least recognized as society. The BC Epilepsy Society is a provincially uh, incorporated nonprofit. Organization and federally registered charitable organization that serves 
the over 50,000 people living with epilepsy in BC and their families, friends, and loved ones, and works to raise awareness of epilepsy in the community in which we live. We are excited to let you know the International Purple Day for Epilepsy Awareness is coming and will take place on March the 26th, 2023. International Purple Day for Epilepsy Awareness is a time when people in the countries around the world take part in events and activities to raise, raise much needed awareness of epilepsy. We'd like to request a proclamation from the Mayor and Council designating March 26, 2023 as International Purple Day for Epilepsy Awareness in Sycamus. Included in this letter is a document outlining our draft pro, um, proclamation. Through your participation in International Purple Day for Epilepsy Perfect. Awareness on March 26, 2023, you will not only be able to show people living with epilepsy that they are not alone, but will also get people talking about epilepsy in an effort to raise awareness of epilepsy in the community. Look forward to working with you on International Purple Day uh, for epilepsy on March 26, 2023 and in the future. Please feel free to contact me via da, 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 at phone number should you have any questions. All right. Yes. Can I make a motion to claim uh, March 26, 2023 is- uh, Epilepsy awareness? You bet, in second most. Sure. Second seconder. Good. Any discussion? Daryl, can you change the lights? <laughs> that was my amendment. Thank you. Okay, correspondence. Oh, did everyone say they're in favor? Sorry, I missed that. No, there's no vote. Oh, oh sorry. Is, in favor. In favor? I don't think any. Hey, does anyone want to speak to? Any of the correspondence? Just have one. Okay, go ahead. More of a up, like, there's an update, and it was from the Minister Kang in terms of, I guess the government's recently announced infrastructure fund. I, I guess it was. Do we have any more information on that? Um, yeah, through the chair. No, it's been announced. We know it'll be allocated. We'll be receiving it in March at some time. So sometime soon. Wow. Um, and yeah, March of, by the end of March, 2023. So we should be hearing something sooner than later. So does the check just show up? Yeah, it probably will. It'll be a direct deposit. Actually, we'll get a notification. COVID one. So yeah, pretty that is used for infrastructure recreation at Existing, such as sewer, if for existing um, infrastructure funding programs, uh, sewer, water, and recreational facilities. It's very loose right now in terms of what, the, it'll have more details once we find out how much, and then there'll, there'll be some type of reporting requirement with it. Um, so once, as soon as we know about it and how much it is, then we can. How much is the overall amount? One billion. One billion, and how many, how many just, 188. <laughs> Let's do the math <laughs> because even if we just get, I think the lowest amount was at 500. That was All right. right. So if you take 188 and divide it um, by 1 billion, I already did it. It's about five, just over 5 million, 5.4. If it was evenly distributed, but it won't be evenly distributed. But so we'll find out. Sycamus will get more because you guys did a stellar presentation when she landed in our fair city we'll community. See. Yeah. Okay, so any questions, we'll go into questions um, from the gallery. You want to do that? Well, I, I was hoping you were just going to go to 15. I don't remember 15, sorry. Okay, Gord, do you have, let, before we do that, Gord, do you have some, uh, a report, council report? I uh, just know I've been pretty busy at work, so this last couple of weeks, I've been planning, Scott's, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're starting to get things going again, and the planning uh, group is looking forward to some applications coming in fairly soon. Excellent. Siobhan? Yeah, just listening in on the planning meeting, 16 minutes, I think it was. Wow. It was fast, it right? Was fast. It was fast. Uh, and I also went to the school district 83 five-year planning um, last week, so that was interesting. Hey, anything we should know? Anything we should be prepared for? No, not yet. Not yet. Hey, Bob? Yeah, I, uh, I got to go to the um, regional library meeting last Wednesday as uh, 
I'm on the board again from this council. And uh, just a couple of things I wanted to highlight um, on their good website. If anybody wants to learn a language, you don't have to pay for Rosetta Stone if you get it through your library. So just do something you want to, if you're going to travel or you want to learn the language um, and uh, you can build robots, you can go to the library and say, I want to build a robot and they will set you up with the equipment to build a robot with your kid. And uh, if you don't want to subscribe to Netflix because they're so ridiculous now, they have something called Canopy with a K and you can sign up through the library to stream movies and TV shows through Canopy for free on your Okanagan Regional Library Network if you have a library card. And ours is open Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays, and Fridays. So check it out. <laughs> the average man in North America reads one book after high school. I dare you to break the cycle. <laughs> That's terrible. That's terrible. My husband likes to read instruction manuals. I learn something new every day. Thank you. I didn't know. Ian. Um, just... Went to a tourism advisory, uh, tourism, what it, yeah, advisory committee. committee. Trying to get all the different kind of needs and wants and desires distilled down. So it's quite a, quite a large committee. We have about, I think, 10 to 12 people on it. Um, so yeah, I've just been going through most, most of that. Pam? Hello, Pam? Here. Hi. 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 Sorry. I don't no, think we reported at the last meeting, but I've attended several um, health uh, uh, related meetings and in, an implementation committee meeting, which is which is it to do with the system change transformation, BC Health System, BC Rural Health Network meeting. Um, and a rural citizens perspective meeting again. So they're all they're all related to uh, rural rural health and wellness. Thanks, That's Pam. All. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you guys all fell short. We're working on uh, select finance committee. Oh. Board is chairing. Uh, we're moving right along with uh, and doing a great job. We're moving right along with that. So, and as well, CSRD is in the middle of, of their drafts as well. So trying to bounce back and forth and, and pay attention to all of that. So um, we've got some stuff coming up. We've got SOGA coming up that some of the counselors are gonna be attending. We've got um, the Kelowna- Elected official seminar. Elected official seminar. So there's, there's lots of stuff coming up that everybody's gonna be engaged in their strategic planning session. Everybody will be engaged in and uh, working on that. Um, the uh, uh, governance committee for the Rail Trail TAC has put forward recommendations that the CSRD um, um, moved on. Was that last Wednesday? I don't even remember anymore. Yes, Thursday. Thursday, last Thursday. <laughs> so that's moving forward. And um, yeah, that's that's about it. Everybody's been really busy. I mean, there's lots going on. So, Gord, do you have something you want to say? You've got your your wings are doing this. I, I apologize. I'm just kind of exhausted. We've been here since uh, oh, 10 hours now today. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, I apologize. Yeah, finance is really important. It and, is really important. and planning and all that. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's a long day when you're doing the finance meetings and uh, and all of us. Everybody's been. But it is, it is really cool that we do have a planning committee and you guys are engaged in that. And Siobhan, you're listening in and, and things are moving forward, right? So it's, it's all very positive. So all good news story. Okay, so now let's go to the gallery. Anyone, anyone? <laughs> oh. Isn't Deb online? <laughs> Okay. She fell asleep too. Yeah. Okay. Going once. Going twice. Okay. We're going to adjourn this council meeting for February 22nd, 2023 at 6.55. Can I have a mover? George, Siobhan, all in favor? Carrie. Bye, Pam. Come on. Bye, Pam. Bye. <laughs>